Hey everyone, welcome to Moving Matt. We do all things cameras with a dash of vlogs and a little bit of travel. And today is finally the day that Nikon released the Nikon Z9. So this is their monster flagship camera that they've been teasing for a long time now. And well, it did not disappoint. So let me go over some of these specs here and give you my thoughts and also go over some of the questions that we still have. So without further ado, this has a 45 megapixel stacked BSI sensor that is capable of shooting 20 frames per second raw. And then if you wanna get a little faster, it is 30 frames per second in JPEG. Or if you wanna do a smaller 11 megapixel picture, you can get up to 120 frames per second. Now, most importantly, they say that all the autofocusing features will be supported in all three modes, which is a very big deal. So some of you may be thinking that 20 frames per second raw doesn't sound very impressive, especially considering that we had the A1 with a 50 megapixel sensor that is also shooting raw at 30 frames per second. And then we have the Canon R3, which is a smaller megapixel count, around 20 megapixels, and it's shooting at 30 frames per second as well. With that being said, according to B&H, these are 14-bit raw files. So whether that means that it's getting the full 20 frames per second in 14-bit, I'm not exactly sure, but if it is, that is still extremely impressive. What is also extremely impressive is they say with this buffer and the CF Express Type B cards, you can get up to a thousand frames or actually more than a thousand frames burst. So that's like 50 seconds of holding your finger on the shutter. Now, why you would want a thousand 45 megapixel images, I'm not exactly sure, but it's impressive that you're able to do that. Now, jumping over to these video specs, you do have 8K30 and also a 4K30 HQ, so it's down simple from that 8K, as well as you get a 4K 120. So we have heard before, and we've actually seen in a presentation, they saying that it will have 8K60, and that is the case. They will have 8K60, but it will not be coming right away. It will be coming in a firmware sometime next year. Also being added in a firmware will be internal 8K RAW, which I think is really awesome, but not only will they have the RAW in their own format, and you'll also be getting an 8K ProRes RAW, which will be really hard on your file sizes, but very great to work with in post. So jumping back to that 8K30, they say you can shoot 8K30 at two hours and five minutes. So that is absolutely insane to see how far we've come just over the past about year and a half. What has it been since the R5? We've had the R5 that, you know, kind of, let's just say it had some overheating problems. And now we've had the A1 that did a little bit better as far as the 8K overheating. And now we have this camera that's pretty much no overheating whatsoever. And I guess it's probably all due to the bigger body and basically them being able to learn from Sony and Canon's mistakes with the 8K. And I think that is a very big benefit that Nikon has over Canon and Sony. They're not being the first movers here. They're not being the people that are gonna necessarily super innovate the market right away. And the reason they can't do that is simply they don't necessarily have the budget right now that Canon and Sony do have. But what they do have is Canon and Sony pushing the industry and then being able to learn from them and put it in their camera and not only just put it in their camera, but being able to perfect it even further in their camera. So it's kind of like what Apple did for a very long time with their iPhones and their iPhone cameras with the Samsung and some of the Android phones. We've been having those portrait video modes for a long time, but now that Apple's done it, now that Apple brought it out with their cinematic mode, even though it still has a lot of problems, it's way better than what Samsung was able to do. So basically they allowed Samsung to innovate and then they somewhat copied, but they copied it when it was ready to go. So that's something that it looks like Nikon is kind of following that model here. And I think it is very smart because it's gonna give them the audience that they need and the money that they need to again, start pushing the industry even further. And really it's just a smart strategy overall. So I kind of hope that they keep implementing that strategy. But talking about copying and then taking it to the next level, Nikon's autofocus seems to finally be on par, if not better than Canon and Sony's in some ways. You can track up to nine different types of subjects all in one mode. So you don't have to be switching between different modes. That is one thing that is very annoying with my Sony is that you have to go, you know, human, animal, bird, or anything that you wanna do. You have to switch the modes. 
and this allows you just to kind of keep it on one mode and I'm assuming that you know if you might have a touch tracking you can just touch it or you use your joystick and it will actually go over whatever subject you want and even in that one mode it will just jump to that particular type of subject. I think that is really smart here. Now from what I've seen they have you know human, animal, bird, motorsports, bikes. I mean they have a lot of different stuff. They say nine different things that they have here. I'm glad to see that they're finally on the playing field with Canon and Sony here. I think their autofocus has been one of the biggest things holding them back and I'm glad that they finally figured it out. So the EVF is a 3.6 million dot EVF. So it's nothing really to write home about here. They really want aren't marketing it very much and I guess we can kind of see why the R5 I think has like a 5.6 million dot EVF and then of course we have the A1 and the A7S3 with that crazy insane 9 million dot EVF so again it's not going to be something that's amazing but it probably does the job just fine and I think if I can remember correctly the EOS R which I have up there it's somewhere around like 3 million dot EVF it might be a little lower than that and it still looks super Super clear to me so I really don't have a problem with the 3 million dot EVF I think it works just fine so the back screen is a 2.1 million dot LCD screen and so that absolutely blows Sony out of the water come on Sony catch up because you're really slouching here and it's kind of weird because you create TVs you're like the only TV company out of the three and yet you're making BS screens so I don't understand that but Nikon good on you now this screen Screen also does you know the cool flippy different stuff now it isn't fully articulating which I would personally like if I wanted to get this camera which it wouldn't really be the camera for me just kind of out of my price range but with all the cool features that it does have I think it is very impressive for photographers and really this is a photographer first camera even though it has insane video features as well and a lot of professionals don't necessarily want it to articulate out I don't really understand that, but some people, you know, comment down below if you're that type of person and the reason why you don't like it to articulate out, is it just a durability issue? Just let me know in the comments below because I like it to fully articulate out. As mentioned before, this does have CF Express Type B cards and I said cards meaning dual two CF Express Type B cards, which is a big deal for professionals and good on you Nikon for adding that in. And speaking of professionals, this will have a full size size HDMI port which is a very awesome thing for anybody who's a videographer and the Sony Alpha 1 and A7S 3 and now the A7 IV all come with the full size HDMI port this makes it very strong it's harder for it to pull out you don't have to worry about it bending near as easy this will have a new ENEL 18D battery which supposedly is even better but it will also be backwards compatible with some of the older Nikon batteries so if you're a professional moving over from the DSLR line now going over to some of the questions here this does have a native ISO range between 64 and 25,600 so that is a little bit more limited than what we've been seeing out of Canon and Sony. It's of course extendable up to 104,000, but I mean, you never really use it up that range. But I just wanna know that it's gonna be fairly noise free within that mid range. And we'll kind of see how the low light performance is. I don't necessarily expect it to be absolutely great just based upon you know the ISO range here but I could be wrong another question I have that I didn't see in any of the marketing was what is the dynamic range of this camera and it hasn't been into many people's hands yet to be able to test that so personally I have not seen what the dynamic range of this camera is supposed to be if you know how many stops the dynamic range is supposed to have drop in the comment section below and let me know now this does have six axis image stabilization which seems to be doing pretty good but there is some jerky movements that I've seen from DP reviews they talked about that so that is one thing that I have a question about if they can actually fix that in firmware or if that's just going to be a feature of this camera but it's good to see that Nikon seems like they're coming along with the stabilization and overall it seems like a good thing so finally the biggest question is when exactly is this thing coming out so now we see the pre-orders are available 
but I do not see any kind of shipping date. It all just says uh, coming soon. I don't believe that Nikon said anything about it. Maybe I just missed that, but I am kind of wondering when this is actually gonna ship out. Now, more than likely, this is gonna be extremely limited supply for a while now. So I'm sure you're gonna get like a message here, maybe like a week, they're gonna say, hey, due to high demands, we are not able to fulfill things, be patient. But everybody knows that, you know, there's a chip shortage and there's just gonna be problems with supply issues. So expect that if you're wanting to get this camera, go ahead and pre-order it now so you can get it as soon as possible. And a big thing about this camera is something I think is very smart, and that is that it's coming in at $54.99 or $54.95 or whatever, it's $5,500. I think that is a big, huge plus for Nikon here. They didn't get their pride in the way. They didn't say, well, we need to compete with Canon and Sony here and, and show that we're just as good and we're gonna place it at $6,000 or $6,500. No, they said, we're gonna give you a better camera or at least as good of a camera and we're gonna place it at $5,500 and save you some money. And I know professionals seem to have like an endless amount of money, but I'm sure everybody likes to save money when they can. And I think at this price point, you actually might be able to get some people who, you know, are even at that prosumer range that look at this camera and they say, man, you know, it's worth me saving maybe up an extra thousand dollars and going for this camera because it has everything I need. But speaking of that, this does have a processor in it that is 10 times faster than the Nikon Z7 Mark II. So hopefully some of this tech will be coming down to some of their lower end cameras in the future. These all look like great signs to me and I'm really rooting for Nikon here. But what about you? Are you encouraged by this camera? Are you excited for it? Are you a Nikon shooter? Do you think you'll be picking this thing up? Are you maybe a Canon and Sony shooter and you're tempted by this camera? Maybe to even switch over to Nikon? Drop in the comment section below and let me know. If you've liked this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And until next time, Peace.